before we jump over to defense, what is your boldest prediction for the offense this year? Let's start with Tyler. Boldest prediction. Um, <clears throat> the Sooners will have two 1,000 yard receivers this year. Marvin Mims and either Jalil Farouk or LV Bunkley Shelton will be the other one. That's that's pretty crazy. I don't think that I've I've looked at Jeff Levy's offenses. And I have not seen two thousand yard receivers either. Um, so no, it's bold, it's Adam. A, a huge jump, yeah. Uh, for me, guys, this offense is the number one rushing offense in the Big Twelve. That is my bold prediction of the year. Even with Deuce Vaughn and Adrian Martinez at K State, not even not even sure if I believe it. But if we're talking about bold predictions, like okay, let's get crazy. If that's the case, OU runs away with the Big Twelve this year. Probably. I'm going to say that this offense averages 40 points a game. I uh, I know that's not like super crazy sounding. It looks like Ole Miss averaged 33.69 points last year. Grand, that's Ole Miss. They're playing the SEC. It's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that this is an offense that can average 40, and maybe they have to score that many. But mm. and there's always the balance of you know defensive head coach high-flying offense, will he slow that down a little bit? Yet to be mm-hmm. seen. But I think there's the tools there to score 40 a game. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, let's transition over to defense, starting with defensive line. Tyler? Yeah, I uh, I can't wait to see um, these guys when we kick things off against UTEP. To me, this is the biggest question mark on the entire team, bar none. Um, how do you replace the production we got a year ago from guys like Isaiah Thomas, Perry on Winfrey, Nick Benito, three difference makers, all playing in the NFL now? We think we know what this is going to look like with Redmond, Ethan Downs, Jeffrey Johnson, but how talented and ready to go is the depth in that room? Jordan Kelly, Co. Roberson, uh, Leulu, uh, and my actually my sleeper pick for def- Big 12 Vita- Defensive Player of the Year, Marcus Stripling. I can't wait to see the effect this new scheme is going to have on these guys to go along with being coached up by Todd Bates and Miguel Chavis. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about this defensive line group. I think this is the biggest surprise group on the team. When we look back uh, at the end of the year, I think this group shines. I think there are some unknown names, but I do think Venable's scheme and philosophy will open this group up to having a, uh, a really strong year. So I'm actually pretty excited about the defensive front uh, this year with Venables and Bates and uh, obviously Chavis at the helm. Mm -hmm. You're a lot more optimistic than I am. You can talk me into Reggie Grimes, Ethan Downs, Marcus Stripling having great years. And I think those guys have the potential. They're highly recruited dudes. And I think that the Brent Venables defense will probably help them out a little bit with some of the exotic blitzes that he likes to run. But man, outside of those three guys, and I guess Jalen Redmond too, if he's healthy, he's a difference maker. Outside of that, I don't like the idea of leaning on G5, a group of five transfers in Jeffrey mm-hmm. Johnson or Jonah Luwalu. Um, Corey Robertson, Jordan Kelly, Isaiah Coe, Josh Ellison, those might as well be the same guy. I don't know that I can tell you the difference between any of them at this point. I know some people are pretty high on Isaiah Coe. He was a junior college guy that you know, is, is huge, and a lot of those guys had to change their bodies in the offseason. So I wonder how much that changes our perception of them. Like, does Isaiah Go- Co come out and he's an absolute beast because he is better playing, you know, up 20 pounds than he was last year? I don't know. But this is definitely the most concerning one. I think this is could be the position group that holds the team back. But, yeah, I mean, at the same time, like, there's some edge guys that you could talk me into. So I don't know. I'm going to have to see this on, one on the field. It'll be one that I'll be looking at very closely in those first couple of games. I think one big difference we're going to see with the defensive line, and I guess this can be the you know the length and girth report of the episode, is just Love the overall it. size uh, of this group. You go down the roster, not a single interior guy. Sits below two hundred ninety pounds. We've bulked up on the edge. Uh, a common thing, guys, that we saw you know during Alex Grinch's days were when we went up against teams with good offensive lines. Uh, we got bullied at the point of attack because of our lack of size. You know, Kansas State and Baylor from a year ago are just two examples. I don't see that happening moving forward with this new staff. Um, you know, Grinch's defense was more of just, I want to say, trying to create chaos by shooting gaps and getting into the backfield, whereas it feels like Venables' scheme is more relying upon, you know, like gap integrity, sound defense that's worked for decades, both in Norman and uh, in uh, Clemson, South Carolina. But Venables' scheme, as a quarterback, you can never really get a true uh, box count with a Brent Venables' defense because there are going to be so they're going to be so multiple up front, whether it's, you know, a 3-4, 4-3, 4-2-5. Uh, 
Um, there, and guys, my last little thing on this defensive line, I, I think that this front seven uh, is going to be a lot better than they were a year ago, simply because they're going to be more disciplined in their assignments and they're going to be so much more prepared on a game by game basis going into each Saturday than they were a year ago. And maybe, you know, playing your best guys on key third downs that could possibly, you know, also help this defense out quite a bit in comparison to last year. You know, who knew, who, who would have thought? You mean it's not a good idea, third and 12, to send Nick Benino back in coverage? Yeah, it's crazy, sure. isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing what happens. Guys Adam, who are stat, stat leaders here. You know, I was just looking this up. I wanted to see what some of these guys had done last year, and I'm guessing there's probably not a ton of stats. Jalen Redmond, three and a half. Reggie Grimes, mm-hmm. two. Josh Ellison, one. Isaiah Coe, one. Marcus Stripling, one. I don't think – did Ethan Downs – he had half a sack. But he's who I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Ethan Downs. And that for me, it simply comes down to I think he could get the most playing time simply because I think he will probably be a team captain by just how mm. things are going this offseason. Mm. He's a guy that the coaches love. I think they trust him. I think he'll be very technique sound. He's totally bought into the culture. So I think he will get a lot of playing time. Is he the best player? I don't know. But there's I think there's going to be a lot of rotation here. Tackles for loss. I'm going to go with Jalen Redmond. Sack leader, I'm going to go with Marcus Stripling. I think that's pretty good. Yep. Uh, I've actually got Redmond for both. I think when he's healthy, he is the best, in my opinion, the best defensive player in this front seven. And so he can be a true difference maker. I think we have seen him obviously injured at times, some pretty significant uh, you know, injuries at times. But when he's on, guys, he's a really damn good football player. So I think if if Bates and Venables can pull the best out of him, which these guys know how to do, I think Redmond's in for a uh, for a breakout year. Linebackers, Tyler, what you got? Let's see. The first question you've got on here: If David Aguagbu starts over Stutzman, that means what? Um, that means David Aguagbu is probably an all Big 12 linebacker, and he's finally reached the potential that many people were mm-hmm. excited about once he joined uh, his his recruiting class just a couple of years ago. But yeah, he's been a guy, David Aguagbu, you know, just going back to Ted Roof last week, he was a guy that really kind of got a lot of individual attention. He talked about, you know, dropping 20 pounds. You know, he, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster, he's more cut up. Um, he's a lot more equipped now to, to handle uh, the week in and week out play of being a middle linebacker at the power five level. And then as far as, you know, statistical categories goes tackle leader, I'm going to go with Deshaun white in this one. Don't feel too good about it, but he did finish last year, third on the team in tackles behind Pat fields and Brian Osamoa. Osamoa is in the NFL. Pat fields is at Stanford. So in this aggressive blitz heavy scheme that Ted roof and Brent Venables are going to run, I'm expecting a big year from 23. Yeah, I've got Deshaun White as well as the uh, the tackle leader. Yes, it's highly possible that David Aguebu being the starter, he's finally caught up to the expectations that we've had from, from quite some time. The only possible negative of that is if Danny isn't there mentally to handle Venable's defense. So it is possible that could be a slight negative, um, but I think that's a really healthy competition between those two that should make them both better. Um, but everything runs through the linebacker core with, with the BB defense. There's a lot on their plate. Their heads have probably been spinning more days than not in this off season. So a lot of question marks about this linebacker group. Yeah. David Aguebu lost 20 pounds in the off season mm-hmm. has been reported. And so I still think he's, he might be still bigger than Stutzman. I think just looking at the Clemson defenders in the past, I think Venables likes a little bit bigger middle linebacker. I do think whoever wins that role probably gets the majority of the playing time because that's the leader of your defense. You're probably not taking them off the field too much. Um, I also had Deshaun White as my stat leader simply because right now it looks like TD Roof is the one backing him up. And if TD Roof is getting (laughs) a lot of playing time, I think we're in big trouble. Um, No disrespect to the guy, but there's a reason he's a walk on. um, Don't don't tell Teddy Lehman that. (laughs) That's what we were talking about before we caught on here. I, I know he loves him, and I know Teddy knows a lot more about linebackers than I do, but being technically sound is not all that of the up? job of a linebacker. Like That is a really good thing, but athleticism and ability, it, it, it's also a big piece of it. And the ceiling for TD Roof is much lower than a lot of other guys on that field. So it, to me, it's the equivalent of Pat uh, Fields playing another season starting at safety. There were much more talented guys behind him, and nobody pushed him. And that's really bad if nobody's going to push TD Roof out of a, a lot of playing time there. So, fair enough. 
Let's talk cornerback first before we get to the safeties. Mm -hmm. You've got Woody Washington pretty much locking down that one spot. Who are you going with opposite Woody, though? I think DJ Graham's going to get the first crack at it. Um, obviously, I, I think in fall camp he's going to be positioned, you know, at that um, uh, cornerback Q or CB one opposite of Woody Washington. But I think um, personally, if if he can build upon what he did in the spring, um, he looked good in the spring game. We heard a lot of a lot of coaches rave about this guy's performance and what he was what he was able to do in such a short amount of time as a transfer from the University of Louisville. Uh, I think that Kenai Walker, uh, just that with his size, stature, his speed out, out on the perimeter, both in pass coverage, being able to come up uh, and make tackles in the run game, I think Kenai Walker is a guy to keep an eye on uh, at that opposite safety or opposite cornerback position uh, on the other side of Woody Washington. Um, and watch out for a guy like Jaden Rowe. Uh, could could also be a sleeper. You know, probably DeMarco talked about the other day, probably the fastest kid on the team outside of Gavin Salchuk is Jaden Rowe, big frame guy. Uh, who's been working out at the cornerback position alone. So watch out for Jaden Rowe and Kenai Walker. I think they could be pushing DJ Graham this year. And that's what you yeah, want, think, guys. Yeah. I think this is the group that maybe has the most, uh, I don't know, hype's the right word or not, probably most hype around them of, of any of the position groups. People seem to be most confident in this cornerback uh, in, in, you know, room in particular. There's a lot of unproven uh, – you know, hype, uh, that is being associated with this group. So I'm not quite as high. Maybe that's the past 10 years of OU defense, maybe giving me a little bit of, uh, keep it at arm's distance, all this excitement. Uh, so I'll believe it when I see it, but Tyler, I think you hit the nail on the head with all the guys that, um, you know, you should probably keep an eye out for, but all the, all the potential in the world with this group, a lot of guys, a lot of experience, uh, super athletic, some young guys who should be able to push these older guys, but we got to see it. I do think DJ Graham gets first opportunity here. And to me, he was a guy that came into 2021. Everyone thought he was going to be a star and he had the great interception against Nebraska and was kind of just okay at best from that point on. So if, uh, if Jay Vali can help unlock that full potential, I think that puts this defense in a really great position, but I also look at the rest of this line of this lineup here, Connie Walker, CJ Colden. I don't know. I'm not super wild by that. I, I'm on record as saying, hey, I'm not a big fan of G5 transfers. Those typically are guys that come into a situation and they're maybe a little bit overmatched. The one exception I make to that rule is if you come from UCF and you're a quarterback and I want you to do well, <laughs> then I make an exception. But um, yeah, I'm not not super big on that. Maybe he pr proves me a fool and that'd be awesome if he did. But um, love that. Uh, yeah, I, I just I feel like DJ Graham's the guy to beat there. Um, mm -hmm. Got to keep his mom happy. So uh let's, <laughs> wish, let's talk. wish him a happy birthday damn it <laughs> <laughs> let's talk safeties here we've got the strong safety free safety and then that <laughs> cheetah position so i know tyler you've got some big thoughts on uh on that cheetah role yeah uh the cheetah position is going to be one like like i said earlier uh, venables is going to be very multiple um with uh, a lot of the different packages a lot of the different personnel groups large in part dependent upon what the opposing team is doing what the uh, down and distance markers are but I, I think that it's probably fair to say that the two guys um to start out at free and strong safety is going to be billy bowman and key lawrence i think key lawrence is back to what he was doing at Tennessee being, you know, back at that safety position, not being asked like what we've seen over the last couple of years, going all the way back to Mike Stoops. And even with Alex Grinch, taking your best players in the secondary out of their natural position, throwing them over there to cover up a weak spot or what's been known as a liability. So I think that key Lawrence is, is poised to have a big year and the, the exact same reasoning for Billy Bowman, a guy that was uh, kind of thrown into the fire last year, having to play three different positions in the secondary because of injuries, because of lack of production by other members of the team. So I, I think the Billy and Key are poised to have a big time year. And then that cheetah position, Adam, this is one where I think Venables has a chance to go a lot of different ways with this. And like I said, a lot of it is dependent upon what the situation in the game is, what the, uh, you know, the down and distance is. I think the Jaron Canick in my position, I think that, even though he does not have the same amount of experience as a Justin Broyles, as a Shane Witter, I think that as an athlete and as a the instinctual level of a football player, IQ level, uh, I, I think that Jaron Canick, having those first two games against UTEP and Kent State, he's the best overall athlete. You brought him in for a reason, Venables did. I think you throw Jaron Canick out there, snap one against UTEP. Let him grow. He's going to have some there, – there's going to be some growing pains. He's going to have some struggles. But I think that from the, the complete – 
both in pass coverage and the ability to play up uh, towards the line of scrimmage. I think that Jaron Canick serves better um, than a five foot ten Justin Broyles or a five foot nine Trey Morrison. Uh, so I think you throw Jaron Canick out there week one and uh, let's go. Yeah, I think uh, I won't add too much to that. I think this is the year that Key Lawrence finally starts being what we hoped when he transferred in from Tennessee. I, I think Tyler hit the nail on the head. This is is his breakout year to me. Um, I think that is his position locked down, no question about it. So, um, yeah, to me, this is a, a big year for Key coming up, but Tyler hit the nail on the head with the rest of it. Yeah, I would echo those same things. The, uh, the other position there is – Billy Bowman or Justin Broyles. I think there's been some talk about whether Broyles is maybe a nickelback, that cheater role. And that cheater role can change depending on situation, down and distance and so forth. So you could see a totally different body top types. Like Jaron Kanak does not look the same as Justin Broyles. Right. But yeah, I, as good as he was and an improvement that we saw last year towards the end of 2021, and he played some of his better games of a sooner career there, it's another situation that's like – somewhat similar to TD roof in my opinion like Billy Bowman is the better athlete he has the higher ceiling he has the the more potential there so I think you need to find a way to to try to give him every opportunity to take that job if you can so um, that's where we'll go there before we get into our boldest predictions uh, for defense let's get our stat leader here who do you think leads this team in interceptions uh, I'll kick it off here I think Key Lawrence simply because I think he's going to have that position on lockdown and uh, I think he'll have the most opportunities there yeah, I'm going Woody Washington. Um, two interceptions a year ago. He's back fully healthy. A lot of people are very excited about him. Jay Valai has raved about this kid, what he's been doing this offseason. So I think that uh, him being that guy that you can trust to be out there on an island, I know that that's going to be a uh, that's going to be a matchup that a lot of opposing quarterbacks are going to try to take advantage of with their number one guy. And I expect Woody to hold up and lead the team in interceptions this year. I've got Woody as well. Nice. <clears throat> Bold prediction for defense this year. Let's start with Corbin. Top two in turnovers per game in the Big 12. Nice. It's not nice. bold. Yeah, speed <laughs> is back. <Yeah. laughs> Takeaways equal victory. There you go. Um, oldest prediction for me, I'm just I'm gonna go way out left field in this one. I'm gonna say Oklahoma will have two first team all Big 12 guys on defense. Both of them will not be on the defensive line. It's pretty good. I don't think that's like super crazy to, to yeah, think. I think that's that I, bold. I think it'd be pretty good. I'll give you a bold one. <laughs> Justin Harrington finishes this year as a starter. I don't know what position that will be. There's a couple different ones you could look at. I think he could play corner. I think he could play any of the safety positions and definitely that nickel position. He was a guy that stood out to me in that spring game, and he's fighting and clawing for everything that he has at this point. He, uh, in the spring game, created a, a turnover right there at the goal line. He's kind of a unusually long body type length and girth but also has incredible speed which we think he still has after that acl tear he kind of to his own fault floundered last year it seems and basically walked away from the team had to beg to get back on this team and this is his last chance this is his last chance of you essentially and so mm -hmm. he's this is his last year of eligibility as well i think so if he wants to do anything you know, in football past this point, he has to start putting something on the field, really, in my opinion. And so I, th I think he has the most fire under his belly to, to get there. And it will probably take a couple of games, but I think he's going to be hard to keep off the field if he really is that talented. Did we go through I was the last one, I guess. So that's, that's everything. Yeah. So let's mm -hmm. also, let me also pose this question to you. I think, Tyler, you wrote this one down. I really liked it. What's more likely, the top five offense or a top 40 defense? It's really tough. That is that is really tough. Um, I feel like both are realistic <clears throat> for this team. I know it is year one of Venables, year one of Jeff Levy. Um, if I had to pick, I'm going to go top five offense. I think that the, I think the pace at which this team is going to play, kind of like what you talked about earlier in the episode, Adam, it's kind of, it's been a long time since Big 12 defenses have had to deal with the, the same <clears throat> pace of play as like a 20, 2011 or a 2013 Baylor when Art Bryles had that thing humming. Um, so I think that Dylan Gabriel, if if this team can stay healthy and the offensive line can play as well uh, as we you know project them to do, uh, I think that this is a top five offense nationally. And Dylan Gabriel, if this is a top five offense nationally, Dylan Gabriel is going to be in New York. 
I don't think you can have both of these, <clears throat> my personal opinion. I think if the offense is humming, it, it provides too many snaps for the defense to cover. And if the defense is really, really strong and you're seeing them break in the top 40, maybe they've slowed down pace offensively a little bit. I don't know if it's possible to have both with this style that Levy's playing with. I could be wrong. I'd love to be wrong. But my gut says, even though I think Venables is going to let Levy have his way, he's still a defensive-minded coach. So I think what's more likely is a top 40 defense and probably like a top 10 offense. Jeff Levy had a top five offense in every season that he's been the offensive coordinator. That includes uh, installing that offense for the first time at Ole Miss. So I think that uh, is a pretty good track record to lean on. So I will go with top five offense. I'm looking up as we speak right now, actually, Corbin, in 2019. It was just a random year. The first year I picked up for Clemson, number four in total offense, number three in total defense. That is pretty what? incredible. That was a pretty me, historic team, though, too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They're pretty damn good. <laughs> let me so, let, let me put. I a, don't think we're there. Let me put a twist on that question for you guys. Put your put your fan hat on for a second when talking about the overall. You do this better than anybody, Tyler. So okay, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> when, when talking about the the overall outlook and the direction in which this program is heading in year one of Brent Venables. Would you be more optimistic about the direction this program is going if this team has a top five offense or a top 40 defense? Which would you rather have? It's got to be the defense. Depends on right? how far, it depends on how far off the other one is. Okay, let's just say, would you rather have the number five offense or the number 19 defense? Which is going to make you more excited? It's got to be defense, right? I will say with Venables as the head coach, I know the defense will get there eventually. So if they're 45 this year, I'm not super concerned. I know they'll get there eventually. The offense is something that I, and I think they will with Levy, but longer term, like what are they after he leaves? He will at some point, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it's kind of like, who cares at this point? As long as one of them's coming, like we're going to win a lot of games. Yeah. Yeah.